If you will, open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 13. The Gospel of John, chapter 13. We're going to work our way through two chapters this morning as uh, we've jumped in to our sermon series in preparation uh, for the celebration of Easter, uh, the celebration of the great reality, the great truth of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. And so we're, uh, I'm not sure we're flying at 30,000 feet over this text, but uh, uh, probably we're at least on top of a tall building or maybe Mount Chiha. And so we're, we're looking and taking a, a, a big, broad sweep of uh, these uh, great truths as Jesus faces the, the last week of his life and is prepared to go to accomplish that which has been uh, determined, that which has been ordained, that which has been decreed since before all worlds were uh, created. He is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is the one to sent into the world to redeem fallen humanity uh, from their sins. And so uh, let's continue uh, this discussion this morning. Uh, I call the series Triumph and Tragedy. Is it tragic? that the Son of God, who was sinless, who was perfect in every way, was hung on the cross by evil men. Yes, indeed, it is a tragedy. But let me tell you, in that tragedy, God ultimately triumphed over sin and death and the grave. Jesus was no victim. He was indeed the victor. And so I'm going to read this, since it is a larger section. I'm going to read the first 30 verses that we're going to consider uh, this morning. And then as we move forward, I will take uh, each text, each portion of our text uh, in its order. Again, Gospel of John, chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper... When the devil had already put into the heart of Jesus Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. And then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to portray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. And when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done for, to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. And I'm telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does, you may believe that I am He. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I, the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in His spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at a t at table at Jesus' side. And so Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. 
And so that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. And so when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. Pray with me, if you will, this morning. Father, we thank you for the goodness of your grace, for the truth of your gospel, for the power of your resurrection. Lord, we pray that all of these realities would uh, rest upon us in this time, that, God, your Spirit would work in us and among us and through us, and, God, that you would apply your truth to our lives for our own good and for your own glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We enter into a time in this final week in which Jesus has moved into a, a secluded place, a place remembered as the upper room, to spend these final hours with those who have been most intimate with him during the course of his earthly ministry, namely these 12 disciples or 12 apostles. And John notes for us a couple of things as he begins this particular section of Scripture. He reminds us again that it is Passover week, and again, that Jesus ultimately is the final Passover. He is the fulfillment. He is the effective one who delivers us not from Egypt, but from sin and death. And so Jesus had come to know that the time was at hand, both in the sense of uh, his under, understanding the realities of his omniscience as God the Son, but also he could look in discernment and realize that his enemies were conspiring, and that conspiracy was about to reach uh, its ultimate goal, namely of placing him upon that cross. And so Jesus Christ knew that the time for him to leave this earthly life, for him to uh, end his earthly ministry, but to accomplish his ultimate purpose was at hand. And we're told that he loved his own. There is a reality, and I believe this reality, that Jesus is a lover of all who bear his image, that being all of humanity. But folks, you need to understand there's a very special way that Jesus loves those who have been saved by his grace and cleansed by his blood. There's a special love that Jesus has for those who trust him for eternal salvation. And notice here, he loved his own. He brought them near to himself. And I wanted to pass uh, some final instructions to them and to spend some final moments with them. And we're told that he loved them to the telos. It's a wonderful little Greek word. Every time I see uh, that particular Greek word, telos, T-E-L-O-S, would be the way it would come in to English. I'm reminded of uh, one of the old professors at Beeson Divinity School. His name was Langston Haygood, quite the southern gentleman. Bless his heart, he was a Presbyterian, but God's going to forgive him for that one day. I know he will. God is gracious. But Langston Haygood often would mention, that is the telos. I can just see him up there. That is the telos. That is the end. That is the ultimate. That is the consummation of that for which has been ordained. And so Jesus realized that he is coming to the telos, the ultimate end, the time in which we, he will accomplish that for which he entered the world. And he has expressed his love to the uttermost. How has he done that? By following the path ordained for him to the cross upon which he will die, in which he will suffer for the sins of everyone who will ever believe. The ultimate expression of his love for his people. He died for us. He is the good shepherd who laid down his life. No one took it from him. He laid it down, and he has the power to take it back up again, which he did in being raised from the dead. And so his 
time had come, God had sovereignly determined, he had ordained that this would take place at this time. But part of the mechanism in place for this to all happen was that Satan would influence I don't understand if, if it was uh, what we would speak of as a demon possession or whatever, but in verse 2 we're told that Satan had so influenced Judas as God had ordained for it to take place that he went out to betray his Lord. Now we've talked about this a bit before. I, I don't, I'm not going to belabor the point. But please understand, Judas Iscariot did exactly what he wanted to do and he received justice from Almighty God. Never think of him as one that was railroaded against his will. Okay, He did that which he wanted to do, which is that which God had ordained he would do. Remember Peter preached on Pentecost that this Jesus whom you crucified was handed over according to the set purpose and foreknowledge of God. God had established the when, the where, and the how his son would play, be placed on the cross. Part of his sovereign plan was that wicked men would express the evil of their heart by nailing his son to the cross, which would carry out the plan of God in his son's suffering and dying for our sin. And so, God's timetable is carried out through Satan's machinations, okay? Uh, as Luther said it, the devil is real, he's powerful, we ought to be concerned about him. But let me tell you something, he's God's devil. He can only do what God allows him to do. He's never been able to do more than that, and he never ever will do more than what God has allowed him to do. And so we move to verse 3, and we see the confidence of our Lord Jesus Christ. That he knows that these things are under his and his father's plan and power and so he is ready to set these things in motion now in verses 4 through 20 or 3 through 20 if you want to kind of step back that far as I studied those this week and as I read once again from the commentaries by one James Montgomery Boyce again a Presbyterian that has been forgiven for being a Presbyterian. He's been in heaven for about 10 years now, okay? He knows the truth. He knows how to do a baptismal service, okay? And so, uh, but, but, a, but a tremendous, tremendous theologian and a tremendous commentator and a tremendous expositor. As I read this week, I, and I've told you this many times before, after being a Christian for now nearly 47 years, I don't have a lot of aha moments. It's my fault. I should have an aha moment every time I think about the grace of God that saved a sinner like me. That's on me. That's on me. I ought to never get over the fact that God has saved me. But as I read this week, and Boyce went back and said, what you see in this little snippet where Jesus at this final Passover, this thing we call the Last Supper, you see a kind of a parody of, of the entirety of his incarnation. Make a note here. Go back to Philippians chapter 2 and begin in verse 5, this great confession, possibly even a, a hymn sung in the early church that describes the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what you see is you see the pattern followed here. Just as Jesus rose from the throne of heaven and took off the veil, the mantle of his own glory to come and be a servant and then ultimately return what did Jesus do as he washed his, his disciples feet he took off his robe he went and he 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 knelt down and and became uh, demonstrated his his servanthood and then once again he rose and put that robe back on him and you so you see really the the story of his humanity he disavowed himself of the glory of heaven and entered our realm, and upon his death and ascension into heaven, he once again did what? He robed himself in his eternal glory that was rightfully his. And so you see it. You see it in a pattern in what took place in the washing of this, these disciples' feet. And so we see in this a, a powerful example. Jesus himself said, I did not come to be served, 
but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. The very King of glory, the Son of David, the true and rightful King of Israel, did not come to receive the accolades of men. He came to lay down his life as a sacrifice that would be effective. That is a sacrifice that would truly save men and women who believe from their sins. And so Christ comes in a, in a, in a, in a tremendously powerful object lesson. He stoops and takes this form of a servant. Isn't that what Paul said? He took the form of a servant and he stoops down and he does the most menial of tasks. He washes his disciples' feet. Now, some of you may be familiar. There's always been a, a group of Baptists. They're really not that connected to the Southern Baptists. But there's a group, uh, when I was growing up, we called them hard shell Baptists. Uh, sometimes they go by primitive Baptist or even foot washing Baptist that still engage and include a foot washing when they do the Lord's Supper. And so it's a legitimate question. Is this a practice that should be associated with the Lord's Supper? Uh, my best guess is no, that it's not a part of that which we continue to observe. But I could be wrong. I may be corrected by that one day when we get to heaven. But it is a great example of the servanthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he, he does a bit of explanation. And it applies to us. You know, when Peter objects, Peter being Peter, he's got to shoot his mouth off a little bit. And so Peter says, no, Lord, no, 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 no. And Jesus said, well, you know, if I don't wash your feet, then you're really not a, you're not, you're not a part of me. And he said, well, you need, you need to wash me from head to toe. And he said, no, 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 you don't, you, you don't understand. By virtue of your new birth, Peter, by virtue of the fact that you have been washed in the blood that I am going to shed at Calvary, by virtue of that reality, you are clean, and you're clean once and for all, and you're clean for all of eternity. You can never be dirty again because you have been cleansed once and for all. But yet there is a reality that just as those who bathe, think of the ancient world, maybe they took a bath in a bathhouse, and they would walk back to their home, and even though they were clean, their feet would once again get dirty with the dirt from the street or the sidewalk that they walked upon. And before their wife would let them get into the bed, she would say what? Wash your feet, boy, before you get into the bed. And so Jesus is reminding us that, yes, there is a once and for all cleansing at our conversion, but there's also the daily need to wash our feet as we walk through this world because guess what? Our feet get dirty. That is, we sin. And the great truth that John shares with us in his epistle, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and what? Cleanse us. Cleanse our feet from all the dirt and filth of living in a fallen world. Of our willing participation with all the fallenness of this world. And so Jesus offers this great example and again gives to us and to them a great lesson about the reality of conversion and the ongoing necessity of what we call sanctification, of a daily cleansing as we grow in grace. And so as Jesus then puts his outer robe back on, he shares with them this shocking truth. And we're told, now again, I love paradox and enigma in, in literature. Okay, Jesus knew time had come. Yet Satan was at work. Even though Jesus knew that all things were committed into his hand, Satan was at work. And Jesus was confident that he had come from God, he was going back to God. But now, verse 21, he was troubled. He was troubled in spirit, knowing what was ahead, knowing that this one that he had poured his life into for three or three and a half years. This man named Judas Iscariot, he was going to betray him, and it would be said of him that it would be better had he never lived. Jesus knew 
that he was going to willfully, intentionally carry out this great act of, of betrayal. And for that, he would suffer for all of eternity. And so he's troubled on, on many levels. And so he tells them, men, one of you will betray me. And it seems like at least as much as they stumbled, fumbled around, they were at least humble enough to understand, you know, it could be me. It could be me. You know, I am told, now I don't believe this when people tell me this, I'm told I can be a little cocky and arrogant sometimes. Now, I, I don't see that in me, okay? I really don't. But let me tell you something, folks. Anytime I tend to get pompous about those people or you people doing this or not doing that, guess what? Before I can turn around twice, I could be guilty of something far worse. I could be guilty of something far worse. And so, at least they had the humility to know that they were capable of falling. And so Jesus eventually says to them, here's how I'm going to identify the betrayer. I'm going to take the bread, I'm going to dip it in the bowl of gravy, and I'm going to hand it to him. And when he did, everything was put into motion for him to go out and to carry out this treacherous act. In allegiance with Satan, but in allegiance and consistent with his own sinful desires. And it, this is a bit of a reminder. Just as kind of a point of application. Hear me. Hear me. If you're in an unbelieving state, you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Church is both the best and the worst place to be. Did you hear me? It's the best and the worst place to be. It's the best because you're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and through it you can be saved if you repent and believe. But let me tell you something. You keep, keep dilly-dallying around, you keep tiptoeing, you keep putting it off, your heart can become so hardened to the truth of the gospel, to, to become so resistant to the grace of God that you can so slip and slide into sin that you can never come back. Don't toy around. Don't play around. Judas was in the presence of Almighty God for three and a half years. He never fully closed with Jesus Christ, claiming Him as His Lord and Savior. And ultimately, he fell away, and he was doomed for all of eternity. How many people will spend their lifetime in church but will suffer a similar fate? Because, again, they played around with the things of God. And all God's people said, and oh me, and oh me. All right, so we see here this master's example. Second section, the disciples' ethic. Go down to verse 31. Let me read, please. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. How is the follower of the Lord Jesus Christ to live? Live by the way of love, live by the sacrificial example of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus introduces this commandment with, again, some sayings that, that ultimately went over their heads. We get it, they got it, after the Spirit came upon them at Pentecost, but that God is glorified in His Son and is glorified in the death of His Son, on the cross at Calvary. He is glorified in defeating death. He is glorified in defeating Satan. He is glorified in defeating sin at the cross of Calvary. In all of these things, He is glorified. And He tells them, I've been telling you, I'm telling you again, I'm about to go away. And I've been telling you, I've been telling everyone that it will listen, you can't come there. Now, 
Just kind of, I'm going to kind of leave that hanging. You can't come there. Part of the reason is the plan is for me to go. The plan for you is to stay. Okay? That's part of the reasoning. The plan for me is I'm going to go the way the Father has ordained for me to go. The plan for you is you're going to stay and you're going to tell everybody about me until the day God ordains to take you to where I am. Okay? But you're going to be here. I'm going to be leaving. And so as a point of emphasis, after saying, I'm going, you're staying, you can't come where I'm going right now, he says, I'm going to give you a, a new commandment. Now, it is a commandment that ultimately in some sense summarizes the entirety of the uh, Old Testament or Old Covenant commandments. And that is that we are to love one another according to the example of the Lord Jesus Christ and according to the power of given to us through the Holy Spirit. The only way that we can biblically love one another is through the power of the Spirit. We are all at some point and in some way unlovely. In fact, some of us are downright aggravating. Okay, I'll just tell you. I won't call any names. Y'all don't call any either. But we are commanded not to have so much affectionate feelings toward one another, which is a good thing to have. It's a good thing to have affectionate feelings. But we're called to put the love of God in action, displaying it and demonstrating it and applying it to one another. As we looked at in Sunday school this morning, love is a verb. Love is an action. Love is an act of your will determining this is how I'm going to treat my brothers and sisters in Christ. And Jesus said, this is the commandment that just as I have loved you, I have loved you in action. How have I loved you? You're going to see my love for you and that I am going to die in the place that you deserve to die. I'm going to lay down my life for you. So you love in that sacrificial fashion. And then he says this. Look at verse 35. And this is how people are going to know if you're one of mine. This is when the world looks at the church, they can know there's something different. This is how they're going to know if you're my child, is by the way you love one another. By the way you demonstrate your care and concern for one another in the time of crisis and need. I'm telling you, I command you, love one another sacrificially, even when it hurts. Even when it's costly, even if it costs you your life, you love one another. And then the world will know that you're one of mine. That's heavy. If that doesn't buckle your knees, you're not paying attention. But let me tell you something. Because God is working in us, it is within our reach to love one another biblically. Okay? As I've often said, and it's true, it's, hard, it's a hard distinction to make. You don't have to like each other very much, but you do have to love one another completely. Okay? You do have to love one another completely. Let's look at the third issue. We've seen the master's example. We've seen the disciples' ethic. Now I want to look at the Savior's instruction, beginning in verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, 
you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do. And because I'm going to the Father, whatever you ask in my name, that this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus again shocks these disciples. He's announced that one is going to be a betrayer. And now he says that one, namely the most visible, the most vocal, uh, maybe the most uh, courageous of all the disciples, one we remember as Simon Peter, he is going to be ultimately a defector. He is going to fail. And you know, one of the, I guess it's a cliche, I, I guess I've heard it in sermons and things, but one of the great reassurances of Christianity is this, our failures aren't final. Imagine the Apostle Peter failing. I'm sure if, if, if you wanted to scrap, Peter would throw down with you. If you wanted to argue, he would get in your face. He was a guy that was ready for anything that came down the pipe, and here he finds out, you're going to betray me. He ultimately does, and it broke him at his strongest point, and he remained broken forever. Therefore, he could be used and molded into the shape that God would have him to be to use him for the balance of his life. He learned, he grew. His failure wasn't ultimately final for Peter. But it was shocking, and certainly the disciples recognized Peter's boldness. They recognized his leadership. And so Peter's going to fail, Judas is going to betray, it, it's going to be a big mess, and Jesus is going to leave us right in the middle of it. And then he says to them, let not your hearts be troubled. It's got to be within the providence of God, all things are. January 2012. Linda Smith, don't leave this room right now. This is, I got something to say. Come here. Tell her to come here. January, tw January 2012, what happened? Their house was shaken off its foundation in Center Point, Alabama. The Sunday following that, I chose to step into the pulpit of Center Crest Baptist Church and I chose to preach this passage. Several weeks ago, I made the decision as to what I would be preaching through the Easter series with no idea that on this day when our hearts indeed are at least sober by the troubles that go on around us that we would come to this passage again. Folks, the coronavirus is a serious thing and Jesus still, still says to us, let not your hearts be troubled. We believe in God. We believe in Jesus Christ. He has gone and he has prepared a place for us. You know, coming from a family that's involved in construction, that's always kind of caught my attention. You know, my favorite carpenter. My favorite carpenter's been in heaven for 12 years now. I hate to say this, Brad Vines, but my favorite plumber's there too, Gordon McGuire. My favorite painter, Joe Purcell. My favorite cabinet man, my Uncle Dallas. I don't know if they're building a place for us when we get there one day. I don't know how that works out. But sure is a sweet thought here on this side of heaven that they're doing what they love in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has gone ahead of us. He has gone through death for us. The coronavirus may kill some of us. It's possible. I don't know that it will or it won't. But let me tell you something. If you know Jesus Christ, the place is prepared and it is certain and it's true. And he says to us, Corona let me tell you, folks, one of the tragedies, at least in my mind, of this whole mess 
is we'll be right here again this time next year with something else. And the year after that, we'll be here with something else. And the year after that, we'll be here with something else. It's coming. It's coming. And Jesus still says to those who know Him, let not your hearts be troubled. I've got this. I've got this. We are indeed in His hands. And so, He says to us that there is indeed comfort in the storm. There is, there, you can know peace in the midst of great difficulty. Folks, it is not a cliche. We live in a fallen, sin-shattered world. It, it's, again, Drew, Drew kind of mentioned it. But you know, one of the things when we've gone on these mission trips to third world countries, one of the things they tell you to bring is toilet paper. Bring your toilet paper. You may not have any when you get there. Guess what? In the course of about five days, go buy you some toilet paper in Birmingham, Alabama. I've said this for years. It wouldn't take but 30 seconds to turn any place in this country into a third world country if God were to unleash all the powers of fallen creation upon it, whether it's tornado, whether it be flood, whether it be hurricane. Okay? And Jesus says what? Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Even if I choose to bring you home, I've been expecting you. I've been preparing for you. Welcome home. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. It is ready for you. It is prepared. I knew that you were coming. Why did you worry so much about it while you were down there upon the world? Yeah. And so, Jesus speaks of the reality that we may know peace. Now, Jesus said to those disciples, Now, I'm going away, and, and, and you can't come, and what's the deal here, Jesus? And then Jesus explains to you, I'm going away, but I'm coming back for you. And the way to join me is through me. That is, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Young people, hear me. Your peers, if they say anything about quote-unquote religion, they're going to say something along the lines that all religions are the same and there are many ways to God. There are many ways to heaven. There are many ways to peace. And folks, that is a lie. It's straight from the pit of hell and it smells like smoke. Jesus himself said, I am exclusive. I'm singular. I'm exclusionary. That is, I am the only way that you may know eternal life. I am the only way that you may have forgiveness of sin. I am the only way that you'll ever make it to heaven. It is through me through what I did on the cross. He is not a way. He is not the best way. He is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so Philip still being kind of a dunderhead says, well, wait a minute. Show us the Father. And Jesus says, listen, you've been looking at him for three years. What's your deal? What's your deal? I've been with you. I am one with the Father. Trust me. Now, Look down at verse 12, 13, and 14. One of the things that I often come back to, you've got to rightly divide the word of truth. You've got to rightly divide it. You can, get, you can take a Bible, and you can get to a lot of bad places with it. Okay? By perverting, distorting, misunderstanding, listening to those that don't have a clue as to what they're talking about. Now then, Jesus says, Whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. Well, Jesus raised the dead. Jesus fed the 5,000. Jesus walked on water. Is that what he means? How many of you walked on water this week? I guess if you lived in Alabama, you did. If you've been living in Alabama for the last couple of months, surely to goodness you've walked on water by now. Yeah. But Jesus is speaking 
in a way that because of what the church that's going to come after him is going to do, it can be described as being greater. We're going to do more things. There are going to be more people saved. There are going to be more people healed through the efforts of godly doctors and godly people working in hospitals that you're going to do far greater things than I've accomplished in my little brief three years on earth. He's not implying that if you pray for a Mercedes Benz and you have enough faith, you're going to get one. You're not going to be raising the dead. But you're going to do great things in that the gospel is going to go far beyond this little podunk place here in in Palestine. It's going to go throughout the world and I'm going to save people that have never heard of me. I'm going to save sinners and they're going to be a, a vast multitude that will one day be gathered around my throne and they will praise me as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth and they will sing, Worthy are you for you ransom from every tribe, tongue, and nation people to gather around you forever that's how we do greater things it's through the gospel that he accomplished for us final thing we've looked at the master's example the disciples ethic we looked at the savior's instruction let's look at the son's encouragement verse 15 if you love me you will keep my commandments and i will ask the father And he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be with you in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him and will come to him and make my home with him. And whoever does not love me does not keep my word. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, nor do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you love me, you will have rejoice, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Jesus encourages us, even though he's going away, he is sending one that will be with us forever. In, under the old covenant, it seems to me the emphasis, emphasis upon God's dwelling with his people was him dwelling among them. Under the new covenant, one distinction seems a greater reality of him dwelling within us as believers. He still dwells among us. We've talked a lot about that over the years, but he dwells within us to empower us, to equip us, to remind us of the things that he said to us, to comfort us, to help us in these days that are surely filled with trouble. Jesus promises, I will not orphan you. I will not leave you without parentage. I will be with you. I will be with you even unto the end of the age. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so Jesus says, I've spoken these things while I'm still with you. But there's one coming, the ultimate teacher, the one that dwells within you, the helper, the paraclete. He will instruct you. He will teach you what happened. The disciples didn't fully understand what was going on. They did not fully get Jesus. But let me tell you something. When Jesus left and the Holy Spirit came, their eyes were opened, their minds were equipped to grasp the great truths of who Jesus was and what he came to accomplish. Then they spent the rest of their life proclaiming that truth in the power of his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came because Jesus left. 
And so he came uh, to equip and, and to, to guide us, to instruct us, to give us understanding as to the truth. What the truth is, what the truth is not. Look at verse 15 one more time. One of the things that I often pontificate on. Sometimes I hoop and holler about it. Is the idea of a powerless Christianity or a powerless gospel or a powerless conversion. This is one of many verses to be found throughout the Bible. That for those who know Jesus Christ, He does a work in your life that changes you forever. If you love me, what? What? Absolutely. If you love me, if I have so worked in your heart that you believe in me and that you love me because I am your Lord and Savior, you will obey my commandments. Your life will be definitively different than what it was before you came to know me. And so, why? Because the one who came upon the departure of the Son is changing us from the inside out. He's working in us. He's bearing witness to the truth. He's comforting. He's, he's equipped. Have, have you ever been so distraught that you just can't do anything? You know what I'm saying? And then the Spirit of God comes, and He reminds you, let not your heart be troubled. He reminds us that I work all things according to the counsel of my own will. He reminds us that all things work together for the good of those who love Him, those that are called according to His purpose. He reminds us that even though you slay me, I will rejoice because I can. Because I know my Redeemer lives and that one day I too shall stand and I shall see Him with my very eyes because our Jesus did what the Father commanded. Our Jesus loved the plan of the Father. Our Jesus carried out the work of redemption on the cross at Calvary for the glory of the Father, for the glory of the Son, for the glory of the Spirit that God would be glorified, that He would be praised by many people, by many people groups that would hear of this accomplishment. They would hear of this gospel. They would hear of one who came, who laid aside the privileges of heaven and took on this form of a servant. He came and not only metaphorically washed our feet, He washed us from our sins by laying down His life and taking it up again. And He has come so that we may know that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And He has prepared our place with Him forever. Let not, let not your hearts be troubled. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word, for it is a testimony of Your accomplishment, what You have done for us. In your Son, Jesus Christ, we thank you for that truth. I pray that we would live in light of that great truth. I pray that your Spirit would cheer and guide us because great is your faithfulness, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We believe in you. We trust you. We're going to follow you. And we know that you're going to be with us wherever we go. Lord, I pray today that if there's those here today, they've not trusted in you as their Lord and Savior. They do not know you as their Savior and Lord. I pray that you would so work in their hearts, Lord. You would cause them to believe your truth. God, you would open their hearts, and Lord, they would believe and be saved. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.